The Vulture Once upon a midnight chilling, as I held my feet unwilling, or a tub of scalding water at a heat of ninety-four, nervously a toe-in, dipping, dripping, slipping, then out skipping, suddenly there came a ripping, whipping at my chamber's door. "'Tis the second floor, I muttered, flipping at my chamber's door, once a light and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember, it was in the chill November, and each cuticle and member was with influenza sore. Falteringly I stirred the gruel, steaming, creaming o'er the fuel, and anon removed the jewel that each frosted nostril bore, wiped away the trembling jewel that each reddened nostril bore, nameless here for evermore. And I recollect a certain draught that fanned the window curtain, chilled me, filled me with the horror of two steps across the floor, and besides I'd got my feet in, and the most refreshing heat in, to myself I sat repeating, if I answer to the door, rise to let the ruffian in who seems to want to burst the door, I'll be damned that and something more. Presently the row grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Really, Mr. Johnson, blow it! Your forgiveness, I implore! Such an observation letting slip, but when a man's just getting into bed, you come upsetting nerves and posts of chamber's door, making such a row, forgetting... Spoke a voice beyond the door. It isn't Johnson! Nothing more. Quick a perspiration clammy bathed me, and I uttered, damn me. Observation rested from me like the one I made before, back upon the cushions sinking hopelessly, my eyes like winking on some stout for private drinking, ranged in rows upon the floor, fixed, and on an oyster barrel full beside them on the floor, looked and groaned, and nothing more. Open then was flung the portal, and in stepped the hated mortal, by the moderns called a vulture, known as Sponge in days of yore. Well, I knew his reputation, cause of all my agitation. Scarce a nod or salutation changed, he pounced upon the floor, coolly lifted up the oysters, and some stout from off the floor, helped himself, and took some more. Then this hungry beast, untiring, fixed his gaze with fond admiring on a piece of cold-boiled beef I meant to last a week or more. Quick he set to work, devouring plates in quick succession scouring, stout with every mouthful showering, made me ask to see it pour, if he quite enjoyed his supper, as I watched the liquid pour, said the vulture, never war. Much disgusted at the spacious vacuum by this brute voracious excavated in the beef he'd eaten quite enough for four, still I felt relief surprising when at length I saw him rising, that he meant to go surmising, said I, glancing at the door, going, well, I won't detain you, mind the stairs and shut the door. Leave you, Tompkins, no war! Startled by an answer dropping hints that he intended stopping all his life, I knew him equal to it if he liked or more. Half in dismal earnest, half in joke, with an attempt at laughing, I remarked that he was chaffing and demanded of the boar, asked what this disgusting, nasty, greedy, vile, intrusive boar meant in cloaking nevermore. But the vulture not replying, took my bunch of keys and trying several, found at length the one to fit my private cupboard door, took the gin out, filled the kettle, and with a sans foi to nettle any saint, began to settle calmly down the grate before, really, as he meant departing at the date I named before, of never, never more. Then I sat engaged in guessing what this circumstance distressing would be likely to result in, for I knew that long before. Once, it served me right for drinking, I had told him that if sinking in the world my fortunes linking to his own, he'd find my door always open to receive him, and it struck me now that door he would pass, perhaps never more. Suddenly the air was clouded, all the furniture enshrouded, with the smoke of vile tobacco. This was worse than all before. Smith, I cried, not in not offensive tones. It might have been expensive, for he knew the art defensive, and could cost the monger's floor. Recollect, it's after midnight. Are you going? Mind the floor, quoth the vulture. Never war. 
Smith, I cried, the gin was going, down his throat in rivers flowing. If you want a bed, you know there's quite a nice hotel next door. Very cheap, I'm ill, and joking sit apart. Your horrid smoking irritates my cough to choking. Having mentioned it before, really, you should not compel me. Will you mizzle as before? Quoth the vulture, no more. Smith, I cried, that joke repeating merits little better treating for you than a condemnation as a nuisance and a bore. Drop it, pray, it isn't funny, I've to mix some rum and honey. If you want a little money, take some and be off next door. Run a bill up for me if you like, but do be off next door, quoth the vulture, no war. Smith! I shrieked, the accent humbler dropping, as another tumbler I beheld him mix. Be off, you drive me mad, it's striking for. Leave the house, and something in it. If you go on at the gin, it won't hold out another minute. Leave the house, and shut the door. Take your beak out from my gin, and take your body through the door, quoth the vulture. No war! And the vulture, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, gulping down my stout by gallons, and my oysters by the score. And the beast, with no more breeding than a heathen savage feeding, the new carpet's tints unheeding, throws his shells upon the floor. And his smoke from out my curtains, and his stains from out my floor, shall be sifted never more.